Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Okay. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got some special guests joining us today. Who we got? We have Jay Barnett. We have Taraji P. Henson. And the friend that's always late. Tracy J. Damn. <laughs> Taraji, put all your business out there. Put Tracy. all your business we out there. Blast. <laughs> I told them that you grew and you got better over the years. Uh, they you said when you was time to go to the prom, Taraji was the prom. It the was bins, the uh, back to school jam. The back to school dance, and you was late. Oh, you went all the way there. Okay, I got some. Uh, yeah, girl, I got that's some. Trauma. That's trauma. That traumatized me. <laughs> okay, let's bring up this trauma. Let's talk about trauma. <laughs> 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 well, listen, c- congratulations to both of y'all on the new talk show on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Is, is that something y'all you. envisioned when you first started this journey to get folks mentally healthy, that y'all would have that kind of platform? Well, I never saw a show. For, it was first things first was just to get the help to the people, mm-hmm. you know, eradicating the stigma, going to Congress, getting legislature. That was first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then... um I guess I don't know how to. I forget how the show came about. Well, well, well. You know, Taraji and I are friend friends, so we have these discussions all the time about how we can further our, you know, journey into mental health and how we can get more um, eyes mm-hmm. on the on the topic. And so we talked about doing first. We talked about doing a digital content piece, you know, where you just do small oh, little yeah. snippets, and and then it grew into well, we can reach a larger audience and really sit down and talk to real people about real issues um, and, and really get it out to, to millions. So, you know, that's how it came about, a series of conversations, late night conversations, morning conversations. So we're happy, we're happy we got here. What got you into the mental health space so much, Taraji? Because you are such an advocate for it. Like, what got you into that space and said, I need to help more? Well, I mean, it was personal for me. It was my personal journey searching for therapy for my son and for myself, for of our own past traumas and watching him try to maneuver through life becoming a young black man without male figures around because his father was murdered tragically um, when he was young. And then two years later, my father died. So mm. those are all his males that he looked up to gone, right. vanished, just done, dead. And so that's trauma for a young boy, a young man. So, you know, we looking for therapy and it became an issue. So I remember calling Tracy, my best friend, she's dealt with anxiety and I've dealt with that with her my entire life. So we started having conversations and I was like, you know, why it doesn't happen. We can't find any culturally competent therapists because we don't talk about it at home. So we don't even go to school to study it. And Mm -hmm. so we don't have, and it's hard to find this out here because it's such a stigma. So we started talking about that. And then I brought up my dad and what he went through. And I was like, you know what? With my sister who worked um, for years at a rehab, a drug rehabilitation center. And we just powwow, the three of us and my assistant, we came up with the foundation. And then we just, it just took off like wildfire. The Boys Lawrence Henson Foundation. Y'all just, y'all just gave out a free round of, uh, of therapy too, right? Exclusively for men? Yes. Mm-hmm. Exclusively for men. Because what we found um, in the first two rounds for the COVID relief that we did um, is that 93% of uh, the people signing up were women and only 7% men. And that, you know, being a mother to a young black male, that touched me and Tracy in a way. And so we wanted to single out the men this time. Mm-hmm. And overwhelmingly, we had to shut it down because it the, all the slots are full. Everything is wow. amazing. Well, it was a, a great outcome, right, Tracy? It, is, it's an, it still is an amazing outcome because they get yes. five sessions. So it's not just a one hit wonder kind of yes. thing. Now, and we reached out to like Jay, who's on the line here now. I love and- Jay's hoodie, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Now, Jay is a Thank former you, professional football player. He's an author. He's a speaker, marriage counselor, yeah. family therapy associate. Now, how did you get connected with Jay? And, and tell tell the people what you do, Jay. So right now, thank you, DJ, MV, and Charlemagne, and um, Taraji. So uh, th- this is really a great opportunity. Um, in this field, even when I came through grad school, I was the only black that graduated. And then I was the only black male. And so as Taraji said, there's not a lot of black males or just even black in general in the mental health field that are mm-hmm. even going through the process. And so for me, to partner up with Taraji and his foundation. It's, it's a personal thing for me. After football came to an end for me, I'm a two-time survivor of suicide attempts. And so wow. um, I dealt a lot with depression. Um, 
I'm the son of a pastor. So my family was, you know, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. And so for me, I had to really find my own space and really find my own journey because while prayer works, but I do think that there is a capacity where we need to visit the mental capacity of it because the spirituality is so close to the mental health department because you can't get your spirit right until you get your mind right. And so for me, um, therapy helped me to find out the underlying issues to my depression was the trauma that I went through through my parents' divorce. Mm. And so right now I'm blessed to be a black male therapist associate to really provide therapy, not only to so many people that look like me, but to also be an advocate for the young black men. Because as you know, bro, we're not really talking about this as men because no. there's a there's a stigma that my masculinity is going to be challenged if I really say I'm uh, impacted or affected by something. So, mm. uh, and it, even Charlemagne, with the work that you do in the mental health field, it, it has to be more brothers like us that are talking about it. Because for men, we got to see it. And once we see it, I think there's a level of comfortability that we have to say that, wow, if he's talking about it, because what I want brothers to understand is that, bro, listen, as much as we all think we're invincible and we're Superman, listen, the reality of it is that we're all Clark Kent. So the reality mm. of it is that we're trying to find our way through it. And so, You know what I realized, Jay? You know, a lot of times that, that toughness and, and that, that, that acting hard is like a defense mechanism, right? Absolutely. And I think that once we let that veil down and we, 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 get, we collect with each other, that mm-hmm. gives us the strength that we that we acting like we have, that unity Absolutely. in that group operation, and that makes it easier to be vulnerable. Absolutely, and and that's also the safe place. I mean, because you all know we all have this defense mechanism because we're trying to protect a little boy in us, mm-hmm. and so especially like we have a lot of grown males that have been hurt and been traumatized as a boy. Um, it's projected out in our behavior. It's projected out through aggression, and especially in the in the the sports arena because. That's the, uh, the outlet for many of us. Right. Or you have the music. Uh, it's the outlet. And so we have developed a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms that has become very disruptive. And so through this program, hopefully that these guys can walk away from, with some understanding that their healing is their responsibility. Because we can't change what happened to us, who did it, where it happened. But we do have a great responsibility um, to heal ourselves. I want to talk about the suicide uh, thing that you said earlier um a lot of times especially young adults they feel like they can't take it anymore and suicide is something that they often think about even for myself i've been in a position and i had to think why and for myself it was i, I wanted to be perfect so bad that when i realized something in my life wasn't perfect i didn't know how to take it and i i felt like me not being here would be better off for my family so for, mm. for so when, when when you came to the suicide how did you overcome that for me it was my wife my wife is the one that got me through that my wife and 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 one of my pastors but but for yourself what got you through that man that's a great question and uh, also uh king i commend you because again we don't really talk about these low moments as men so even for you to just share um that very um intimate moment that you dealt with i think because when you look at suicide right and a lot of us black men struggle with this we, we're, 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 we're constantly in this performing phase mm-hmm. yes, where sir. everything is based on performance and we're trying to prove ourselves. Yes, sir. We're trying to, to the hood. We're trying to prove ourselves to our spouses, to our partners. We're trying to prove ourselves to the white man. We're trying to prove ourselves to the world. And you're right. And it's that, that mechanism of trying to, of, of perfectionism. And perfectionism is really attached to a place where either we didn't receive grace or we wasn't really embraced when we did fail. So we feel we have to be perfect. So for me, I only knew football because for me, football was just a coping mechanism. It was the only way that I had to really allow the aggression that this anger and this resentment, uh, it was fueling my passion. And every time I was on the field, every guy I visual, I saw them as my father. Mm. And so for me, when I no longer had this coping mechanism, and as we do as men, when we can no longer identify ourselves through what we do, we feel like failure. And so now I have to deal with this pain in a real way. And the suicide is oftentimes is that most people are not trying to end their lives. They're trying to end the pain. Yeah. Yep. 
Mm-hmm. They're trying to end the pain. Mm-hmm. And so my second attempt was a drug overdose. And I actually survived. And when I pulled through this thing, I realized, okay, I've done this twice. So there must be a real purpose for me. And what I realized is that this purpose had nothing to do about sport, had nothing to do about, you know, uh, uh, being an athlete or this persona that I was trying to portray. It had everything to do about addressing the daddy issues, the expectations, because I wanted so bad to be like my father. That's all I wanted, you know. And so what pulled me through is that one day the therapist asked me, says, if you would have if you would have succeeded in your suicide attempt, what would have changed? Mm. Mm. And working through that, and so she allowed me, or he allowed me at the time, to really have an understanding that once I addressed the pain, it gave me a new perspective out on life. And now I was able to change that narrative and really look at life from a different way, not based on what happened to me, but what I had the power to do. Because really, when you get in therapy, all we do uh, as clinicians is we join with you is that my my objective is not to give you the answers, but it's to allow you to discover the answers and discover the power that you already have. That's right. Hey, you know, um, Jay, you know, you and be touched on something. Imperfect people should not be held to a perfect standard, right? And you Absolutely. being a pastor's son, do you think that caused added pressure? To you? Oh, man, absolutely. And, and as DJ Envy said, it's like, man, and for me, because, you know, as a PK, man, and my dad had, um, he was, he's still a pastor today. He, he was the pastor of a, uh, of a large church. So pastor's kids, man, you're scrutinized. You're on a microscope. So, <laughs> I mean, you're scared to do anything. And then I'd never forget, man, th- and this was traumatizing. I was in elementary and I, I used to be boxing. And I was beatboxing, and one of the teachers said, I'm going to tell your dad that you're beatboxing. This is a sin. I said, what are you talking about? (laughs) This is a sin. (laughs) So so here I am. I'm traumatized because now, you know, I grew up in an era where, you know, we we couldn't watch BET. You know, I didn't watch BET until I was, what, like ninth grade, you know what I mean, Mm until my parents were divorced. So all of these different expectations, man, you know, that was a, a tax. And that right there really drove me, you know, to a place where I'm like, dude, I, I can't live this life, man. Right. Now, Taraji, we were talking right before uh, we got on, right before we started recording. You were telling that uh, you was asking how New York was. And we were telling you it was kind of eerie. And you were saying mm-hmm. L.A. was the same feeling. So break that down, what you've seen in L.A., because this is a, a great point that, you know, a lot of people are, are on the street right now and they can't get their medicine. And where people think people are crazy, you know, these are people that might not be able to get their medicine and just and going through withdrawal and having problems. Yeah, um, a lot of the people that you see on the street, there, there's a lot of new homelessness that's happening Absolutely. because of COVID. And people aren't able to afford or get to their meds or what have you. Um, a lot of the people that are on living on the streets, they're not drug addicts. They're not I mean, these are people who are doctors and lawyers who had families and they're missing right now because they don't they can't get to their meds or they stop taking their meds. And it's interesting because, you know, it's hard for me to walk past, especially a black woman when she's sitting by a grocery store restaurant, because that energy to me looks like just someone trying to eat. So, you know, when I um, I I walked past her and I heard her mumbling something and I said, let me give her something to eat. It's just something. That, and I got whatever I had. I think I had like $20. So I went back over and I gave it to her. And um, as I got closer to her, she was speaking perfect diction. And she was um, she was reciting monologues, classical monologues. Mm. And I or a monologue. And I went over and I heard her and I went in a little deeper, but she was very low and I couldn't quite catch all of the words, but I knew it was a classical piece. And so I just said, how you doing, sister? And she just kind of looked up at me and she kept saying the monologue and I gave her the money. And then for a split second, she looked down. She had a moment of clarity and she was like, hey, girl, thank you, girl. And then she went right back into the monologue. And that broke my heart because I saw an artist. I saw an artist who had dreams, who and then it just then I foresee because I'm an empath. So I take that stuff on. I Mm -hmm. take it on Mm -hmm. and it. It sparks my anxiety. It, it, it sparks 
um, a depression in me because it's like, then you feel guilt because I drive back up to this hill and it's like, what can I do? You know what I mean? What can I do to ease people's pain? And, and, I, and a lot of that is why I started this foundation because I personally could not own, I could not be a billionaire and be okay with all of this hunger and homelessness. I just couldn't. I don't have it in me. Maybe that's why I'm not a billionaire. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you getting close. Yes. Don't act like you're not getting yes. close. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> hey, Taraji and Tracy, I want to ask y'all both a question. How in the hell do y'all deal with us trauma-filled men? And, 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 and how do sisters create a safe space for us to be vulnerable? Woo, who want to go first on that one? <laughs> I'm going to let you talk first. <laughs> um, well, what I what I have learned, because before I was like, get yourself together. Whatever it is, go fix it. Come back when you got it all together. We can build together, et cetera, et cetera. And then once I started to look at what love really is, like the definition of love for me, and love is the desire to understand, mm -hmm. right? And so that's going back to some Buddhist principles. And um, if you are going in, into your conversations, into your Sorry. questioning with the desire to understand, then I think you're, you are creating a space for that black man to be able to really open up to you. But if you're going in with your own predetermined notions, you know, what you're trying to get out of the conversation, what you want him to say or do or fix, you know, I find that that, that was harder to, to be able to make that connection with him. So mm -hmm. my driving point is go in with the desire to understand. If you say you love him. Mm -hmm. If you love him. What about you, Taraji? Mm -hmm. um, you kind of broke up a little bit or I, my, my um, service froze, but I just saying um, to piggyback on what I think I heard, it's just understanding. You have to understand and it's not about, um, winning it's about an understanding about because love really like when you compare this is when I knew I grew up because when you can compare your relationship like with my girlfriends like I don't freak out if they don't call me right back because I love them and I know they love me and I know it's solid what we got mm -hmm. but the problem becomes if you don't have that foundation in the beginning mm -hmm. so I'm okay with we're everywhere. First of all, no one's perfect because that's a, the per my therapist freed me when she was like, the perfect lie is perfection. Mm -hmm. That's, that's right. the perfect lie. Yeah. And she and so and through my therapy and tapping into my trauma, it's like a lot of times it's um, a misunderstanding. So if you go into it knowing that no one is perfect with uh with an understanding of trying to build a foundation of trust where we can both be our vulnerable selves, where we don't have to send a representative because I trust if I fall, you gonna catch me. Mm -hmm. the, those are things you build, but you can only build them if you know, if you have, are, if you are actively dealing with your trauma. And, and a lot of times it's difficult and I'm dedicated to the black man, y'all. I just turned 50 and Wow. You know, and I haven't said it yet, but it didn't work out. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and I tried. I was like, therapy, let's do the therapy thing. But if you're both not on the same page with that, then you feel like you're taking it on yourself. And mm -hmm. that's not a fair position for anybody to play in a relationship. My my happiness is not his responsibility and his happiness is, is, is not mine. We have to first learn how to make ourselves happy, to make each other happy. And so when one person is taking on the weight of the entire relationship, it's never going to work. So I'm not, you have to show up. And yes, you want to be understanding, but you can't lose yourself in that understanding. You, you have to still stand up for yourself and be there for yourself. But it's hard to do if the other person isn't doing that part either. First of all, I want to say That's happy why birthday. Happy, are so yeah. difficult. Happy belated. They're difficult. We, 
We seen you on oh, that thank yacht, you. and you did not look. Thank you. When you said you were fifty, we couldn't believe it. We, you, I said maybe. Yeah, I didn't even think about I it. Was I, like, saw, no I saw way you put that on Instagram. I was like fifty. And I was like, like no way. I, I can't believe it. I have to say it out loud because I still can't believe it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, listen, I, I'm fifty and I can believe it. Trevor, you fifty two? <laughs> you fifty as well? I am fifty two and I can hey, believe it. You, you, you mean fifty two or fifty as well? No, look, Negro, don't put that extra two on me. <laughs> fifty. Okay. I said fifty. All right. <laughs> wow, y'all, y'all, y'all killing the game. That's yeah, right. No, y'all are. Y'all, y'all was, definitely are. I want to go back to love, right, right, fast, Charlamagne. You know the the bad thing about wit, wit. When you talk about love, I think most people don't know what love is when you start out, right? Because mm-hmm. when I started out early, and you know, me and my wife been together since we were 16, 17, you say I love you, but at 16, 17, I, don't, I didn't know what that meant. At, at that age, you ain't doing nothing but sharing trauma. That's it, right? You just say I love you because you think it's the thing to say, but you don't necessarily understand what that is, and until you understand it, then you could be a better man, you know? Because mm-hmm. when we started this show, Charlamagne and, and I were the worst. Lord have mercy. We were horrible. But we grew, I think, just together. Not together, together, but we grew together. <laughs> we healed together. We healed. With you? we healed together. But, <laughs> but, you know, I laugh. You know, we joke with each other all the time. But I'm glad it was him because he was healing the same time I was healing and we were able to talk about it. Because a lot of times, you know, we go to the barbershop and we could talk about LeBron. We could talk about the Knicks. Uh, we could talk about sports. We could talk about this girl and that. But we never talk about We ain't talking about the, them heart issues. That's right. That's right, which which no. we need to do more of. That's why I love what yeah. you guys are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's yeah. the only yeah. way we're going to heal our relationships. That's and, the and, only way. And, and all of my relationships started looking the same. Like two broken people trying to pick up the pieces, and you know, without that that middle beat, that connector, that therapy, the one that's gonna ask you the tough questions, the one that's gonna make you hear yourself in that room. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a good therapist, they just sit and you listen, and you you get to talking, and it, and they don't give a response back. I remember because my therapist is, is a black <laughs> woman, right? And so I was I went in there mad one day. I was like, ah, ah, he did this, and he did this, and I. And my girlfriends will give you that back. Uh-uh, no hit the pop, 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 right? So I feel like I got comrades. Right. So I sat there and I got to doing all of that. And she was just sitting there like this. And she was like, hmm. And I was like, and then, and the stuff that I said to my girlfriends, I got them ramped up. I used it with her and it didn't work. And it forced me to hear what I was saying. And in two minutes flat, I was like, wow, I was so wrong. I mm. need to go fix this. Mm-hmm. And that's why therapy is important because you need yeah. an objective opinion. Your friends ain't it, baby. Your friends ain't it. There's tell them, there's Taraji, involved. Tell them. Your friends there's ain't it. Sta- your friends ain't it because they have stakes involved. That's right. And they are traumatized. And the only thing they're doing is projecting their trauma onto you. So that's why your friends don't work. Yeah, yeah. Now, unless your friend is a therapist. <laughs> Taraji, now when you say things didn't work out, did y'all try to make it work? I ain't tell, I'm not going into that. Okay. <laughs> what you say that? What you do? Because see, what, what you're not going to do is have my day filled with damn bloggers. True, 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 yeah. true, true. That's trauma right like there. Well, you have to go see your therapist after that. <laughs> no, yeah. Nobody's business is going on in my personal life. All I'm saying is relationships take work. Yes. And it takes both sides to really be there. It's selfless. Sometimes you got to sit on it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can't take it to him. Sometimes you got to take it to the therapist and work it out first. That's why it is so important. And no, your therapist ain't your preacher. Your therapist is not your pastor. Mm-hmm. Your therapist no. is not... Nobody at the church is your therapist. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm at the and point I think, where I don't think a house divided can stand. If if I'm if I'm on a journey of healing and you not, it, I don't think it's gonna work. You it's gotta heal not together. ever gonna work because what's gonna happen is you're gonna find yourself growing, right? And that person isn't because mm. they're not doing the work. So naturally, you're gonna grow apart. That's the natural progression of things. And you're going to grow and, apart. And, 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 and this is the issue that we have in relationships because it's, you, you become trauma buddies. And so yes. it's trauma bonding. Ooh. And a lot of the Ooh. trauma... Trauma bonding. The, the, tra- the trauma is holding the relationship together. And as you said, Charlamagne, and that's the challenge. That's when good. one person begins to heal, the other person becomes irrelevant and they become insignificant because when the, you begin to heal, you begin to see different. 
And now you're no longer seeing from a trauma lens. You're now seeing from a heal lens. And you're right, Taraji, and if two people are not connected, whenever I'm talking to couples, I say, listen, you both have to be committed to this journey and you have to be committed to this process because healing is a process. In, in, in so many cases, you have two half people coming together and they're creating a whole mess. And so I'm bringing my trauma, you bring in your trauma, and we create this traumatic experience in the relationship. And it's hard to even differentiate what is healthy and what does healthy look like <laughs> even when a healed person shows up. Man, you know, uh, my yeah. therapist told me that healed people hear differently. And like I've been, I've been with my Very wife different. for 23 years, so I can think of times she said things to me and it was just my ego responding. And now mm -hmm. as I'm older, the things she says to me, I'm responding from a different place. You know what I mean? It's, 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 I'm, I'm not, I don't have a wounded ego anymore. I have a, 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 a healed ego. I'm getting to a place of healing. So I hear things differently. And I think that's, that's, that's a, a struggle in relationships sometimes. Because we think people are yeah. against us when they're not. Yeah. And yeah. then not only that, you hear things differently. You don't even have the same arguments. Yeah. Some things just you're just not even going to argue about anymore because it's like I've done the work. So I that's not going to trip me up no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like because you're growing, Absolutely. you're growing and you're yeah. just not even going to have the same arguments. Because after a while, when you're when it's trauma, you like you said, um, in two have two halves of people coming together, trying to find a whole. <laughs> somewhere in there, a whole person. Um, you, it, oh God, I lost my thought. It was so good too. I'll oh, come back. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. If we just think about the space we just created together, right? Just us mm -hmm. on this Zoom mm -hmm. and feeling safe enough to be able to say the things that we've said so far, you know, to me, that's where the healing begins. So yeah. if, if we can just be okay with not being okay, mm -hmm. right? And saying, look, I'm not okay. You know, I have anxiety, depression, bipolar, or I don't even know what the hell I have going on right now. I just know I'm not okay. But we have created this space together today so that we feel comfortable enough to actually share in that way. And I, that is my hope and my prayer for the work that we're doing mm -hmm. in this space the work that all of us are doing mm -hmm. um, on some level. I'm praying that black men and women can sit down just like this and have some real conversations that may be relevant to your own situation. Um, you might learn something when you hear about other people's challenges and how they address them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my prayer. And, and, and I think we're heading in that direction. That, that's God. why I'm excited about y'all talk show because I don't think it's enough safe spaces for us to express our brokenness. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. No, not at all. Everybody's trying to stay looking young and everybody's trying to stay looking hard and like they rich and ain't nothing going on. And my life is great. My life is great. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. How has coronavirus and COVID affected a lot of people that you're talking to and it affected yourself? I know for myself, it, it was it was actually better for me because I work so much. You forget about the little things like. Like so many, you know, I have five kids, so it's like you miss those little things, but now I get to see and I enjoy it so much. And although, you know, we all want to work because we're worker bees, but I'm like, I, I love the fact that I was home. I was able to connect better with my wife, connect better with my kids, have conversations where I'm not on the phone and I'm like, yeah, 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 but I'm really not listening, you know? So how has it been for you guys? Um, For me, it's been great. I mean... I have, I'm such a workhorse. I have literally been working nonstop for 20 years. I literally feel like this moment in time, this slowdown made me think like, dang, when is the last time you had this much time? I was in Chicago for six years. I had my house in LA. I wasn't living in this house. I was literally treating this house like an Airbnb. I came back and was like, how you turn on the lights? <laughs> <laughs> and so... I mean, I've been able to enjoy my house. I've had my low moments, you know what I mean? Because then if you do, if you are used to working so much and then it stops, you feel weird. Like I felt mm -hmm. like, I, am I going broke? I kept calling <laughs> Mrs. Lynch, I said, am I going broke? Cause I'm just so used to this money coming in cause I work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're far from just please. Uh-oh. You talk too sure. soon. Accountant cut the phone off now. See what you see what y'all was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> phone got turned off. Lost. 
COVID. Well, Jay, I want to ask you a question. How, how important is it to have culturally competent people in 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 the mental health space as mental health care workers? Well, it, it, it's it's important, man, because uh, when you have competent people, they understand the level of care that people need, and also you understand how to provide that level of care to them. And I think it's important, especially right now, because we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, you have all of these different social injustice issues going on. And so, um, as I said, one day I walked into the office, I said, man, I'm black exhausted. And, you know, everybody just kind of like, wow. And it, and it made everybody think because as we are providing services to clients and I encourage every therapist, every coach, every counselor, you need to be seeing somebody too, because there's a lot that we take in daily. And especially now, because I've been busy nonstop since March. And and I'm at a practice where it's only two black males, myself and the owner. And so we have been busy nonstop. We've had more and more young black males come. And, and as you know, in the field of mental health is that people who see a therapist are usually people who can afford it. And so we've been able to provide that service to people. And this is why the foundation of what Taraji is doing is so important, because a lot of people who really need it can't really afford it or their insurance provider or network doesn't really provide the opportunity for them to see a, a clinician. And so I think it's important for us to encourage, uh, and as I'm working to push more young black males to work in the field, whether it's a social worker, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a therapist, we need more representation in the mental health field. Because I think, and as, we, uh, as you was alluding to those safe spaces, I think it's important because even as a man, I know for myself, my, my therapist was white and, and it was, un, it, it was a bit uncomfortable because I knew he did not understand the plight that I had as yeah. a, as a black man. And for me, when a young black boy comes into my office, they're like, Oh my God, man, I can't wait to sit and talk to you. And there's a level of comfortability that they have to just open up. But then there's this safe space because many times as men, even when it comes to women, we're a bit apprehensive because if I become vulnerable in this space, I'm not sure what you're going to do with this information if I share it. If I divulge this, because for, even for me, personally, I don't want to be emotionally blackmailed. Meaning that I'm going to share this information with you and it can possibly come up in another conversation where you use it against me. And so I think mental health individuals need to be culturally diverse and because I have a lot of white clinician that reach out to me about working with blacks and I always tell them educate yourself you yeah. know yeah be a black person because especially in this time it is emotionally exhausting for black people all together every day you turn on the news it's something you know whether it's uh, uh, uh losing George Floyd or the Breonna Taylor and then now we got to deal with the election and you got to deal with your emotions about who do I vote for I mean, it's just so much that we've had to deal with this year. Hey, yeah. Tracy and Taraji, I'm telling y'all right now, I'm getting Jay number before we get off this um, this Zoom. Because mm -hmm. he, he's speaking to my spirit this morning. Because it's something he said yeah. just now. Because I'm sitting there thinking about, and I, and I just stuff I talk to my therapist about, like, everything that I was taught when I was young, like, especially from my fathers and my uncles, like, only the strong survive. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't Ooh. strong, I wasn't going to survive. And that's why we wear that for so long. And then you get to a yeah. certain age and you realize, man, don't none of that serve me no more. If if I, I have to not be strong in order to survive. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have to admit but that this I'm is weak. The but I, this is what I want to get to my people. The strength is in the vulnerability. Yeah. Not this. It's yeah. in the vulnerability. That's where your strength lies. Because when I see a man amped up like this all the time, I see fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see mm -hmm. fear. I see a facade. I see a broken human. And mm. I, oh, I just mm. want to hug him because you don't scare me. You look like a big old broken baby mm. and you need to go get healed. That's right. And that's just how I'm looking at him. I look at him like that because that's too much. Mm. What man needs to do that all the time? Right. Like, that's come right. on. You got to be vulnerable. Your, your strength is in your vulnerability because in that space is where you heal. You can only heal in that space. You have to be vulnerable. And I know because I'm an actress. I, a lot of, I mean, 
for a long time, I kept thinking, see, I'm healing myself because I'm putting it into my work. <laughs> it works for a minute. You know what I mean? And it does allow me to, when I get to therapy, I can talk about the stuff because I do have to tap into those same emotions when I go to work for trains, another broken human, you know, mm -hmm. but um, therapy works. That's all I'm going to say. And you need it. You got to have it. And there are other things you can do as well. Like I, I'm a meditation uh, teacher. I got certified recently. And yeah. that, that for me <laughs> has been the thing that I can do to self-regulate until I get to, to my therapist, Word. you know, um, or as another component, yoga, all of these things that we kind of go, ah, what's that? That's that. That's something out there somewhere. I ain't doing that. That's that white people stuff. Oh, we said, yeah, I was about to say, that's the white people. <laughs> right. And, and look, Charlamagne. Now, I'm not you... interested in goat yoga. Now, I don't need no damn goat on my back. I'm not judging. I see that too. That's a little crazy. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. I'm not judging at all. I'm just saying. I can't ever say her. Um, Charlamagne, when you started talking about walking out on the on the grass, on the ground, right? Barefoot. To get some of your, your healing, which is called grounding. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And it's the actual thing. And I was just kind of reading the comments to see how folk would. I was so annoyed. <laughs> I am so proud of you, brother, for just sharing what you know is going to be some pushback to. You know, mm -hmm. you you know, our people might be like, ah, what's all that hoodoo foodoo you got going on, boy? <laughs> But, but I think but it's also I his nasty ass feet too, because his feet. I, just, his feet. I had just got a pedicure. I had just got a pedicure. You crazy? I love it. I love it. And Jay, what you just shared, man, about safe spaces, and we also have to pull the family up in here mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. when a family member is going through something, right? And what we do as family members is, you know, we either shut him out, you know, he could have been on drugs or, you know, or whatever his situation was. We shut that man out so fast and don't even look beyond what our influence is because we don't get that we're influencing his next move. That's right. If I can't come home and share with my family what I'm going through, then then where can I go? Forget it. Yeah. 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 That, that Man, Tracy, it's so many men that love their wives, but they're not vulnerable with their wives because they don't trust their wives. And for, for trust, trust looks different for men. So most women trust, you know, as you're not going to cheat on me or, you know, hurt me. But men, that level of trust is always with our emotions because that's our most prized possession. When a man open up to you emotionally, he is laying it on the table that's right he starts talking about certain things whether it's childhood whether his failures or his fears he is laying it on the table and if you take that and you use it against him you will never get that man to speak again that's right. and so I, and that's why you, you're right tracy when men are shut out and even when i've heard women you know uh, uh verbalize that if a guy show too much emotions Oh, hey, girl, he too weak. He too, you know what I mean? He, it's like, yeah. now you're telling this man to be emotionless. But here, here, here's, here's the oxymoron in that, right? Later on, you're asking him, Terry, open up to me. Talk to me. But right. you told him when he opened up to you how lame he was and, right. and how, you know, how much of a punk he looked like. So every time we shut a boy down and tell him not to cry and tell him to man up, you're teaching this boy how to be emotionless. So don't be surprised when you have this promiscuous behavior, when you have this misogynistic uh, behavior or personality, and you have this destructive male because he has nothing to do with his emotions but to exercise it through his behavior. So mm -hmm. for DJ Envy and for Charlamagne, bro, I commend both of you just for being open and just even DJ for you saying that you both went on a journey to heal at yeah. the end. Of Man, that's I don't think I've ever heard that. I don't think I've ever heard a man say that. A uh, black man, man say that. Not in a, and that wasn't scripted in a movie. Yeah, we didn't do it on purpose. Like it wasn't something that we planned out. Like it wasn't something like let's go on this journey together. But it was something that I just think we evolved as as human beings and as fathers and as men, and we just kind of we did it together. But it was good because what I was going through is good to have somebody on your side that's not going to laugh at you and make fun of you. 
But when yeah. sometimes he does, but it's not to disgrace you, but it's to make light of it and to help you out. And I do the same thing with him. Like, I can sit there and say his feet look crazy, and he doesn't take it as, oh, my God, Envy's making fun of me. It's like, all right. Because I know my feet didn't look crazy. See? I just got a pedicure, so I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't even bother. Oh, he holding on to that. So, <laughs> oh, no. That's Let it go, bro. That's Let not even go. a trigger for me. I know my feet have looked, looked amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, do y'all think the overwhelming impact of, of coronavirus and this whole pandemic and, and like all the civil unrest we see in the street, do you think that's been pushing more black people to embrace healing and therapy? Absolutely. I'm hearing the, I'm hearing the young rappers switch up the, what they's rapping about. Mm -hmm. um, what's that? Um, what's his name? Baby. I, it's so little, which one? <laughs> little baby. Little baby. baby. Little baby. The baby. Little baby. It's two of them. It's two of them. I know. I know. It's little one baby, the baby, and it's a side of baby. Well, one of them have a song. I'm sorry, babies. I'm sorry, babies. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to the babies. I love both of the babies. Okay. But right now, I'm drawing a blank. But you know which song I'm talking about. What is it called? The Bigger Picture? Uh, Emotionally Scarred. The Bigger Picture, yes. The Bigger yes. Picture. But what I'm saying is I'm starting to hear. So they are becoming conscious, which means something's happening. A shift is happening. We're not staying we're not staying asleep. Something's happening consciously. Cosmic um, consciousness. And, mm -hmm. Yes. And the fact that we opened up the um, the therapy to men and it's going really, really well. Something is happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that was really surprising. Because um, like Taraji said, the first time we did it, we had like 93% women and 7% men. So when we went back through and they just, you know, coming through and and signing up and, you know, we have to do it again. You know, we're going and, back in. But see, the thing about it, and this is all, this is what I always wanted to do through this foundation is to reach men because the mental health journey started with my father, you know, Vietnam vet coming back from war, traumatized and all messed up on the insides from being experimented on Agent Orange, all of that, you know, and, um, I just have this, and I've all, I pray, when I got pregnant, I prayed for a boy. I wanted a boy. So I just, and I love black men so much. I just want us to be, I, it hurts when relationships don't last. I'd love to see black love and I want to see more of it. I want to see our relationships last and make it. You know why? Because our kids need it. That's right. Our yeah. kids need both of the parents in the household. I wouldn't wish being a single fam, single parent on my worst enemy is the worst way to raise a child. I mean, I did the best I could and like my mom did and all the mothers and fathers, single fathers before us, but it's just not right and it's not normal. It's yeah. not normal. And, and you, you hit on something really important to Raji because as the black man is healing himself, he's healing the family. That's right. You know, and we're breaking that cycle so that those young men are growing up to understand what love really looks like, what, what vulnerability really looks like, what strength really looks like. And so, you know, our one of our goals is to break that cycle of, of shame. And I think this is one way to do that. So um, that, I, that, I. That's so important what you said, Tracy, because even as a man, like when you, when you know, like I said, healed people hear differently, but we see differently too. So it could be things you see in your children that back in the day, our parents might've just gave us a beating for yep. or punished us for, but it's just like, nah, he, he's, he's working through something or she's working through something. So yes. you approach it differently. Yeah. Yeah, but but we don't know. We did. We don't. We're just finding these things out. We're just coming to this place because all we had was what was passed down to us. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. You know. Well, yeah. how, how can we get more information? If people want more information about what you guys are doing, how can they get involved? And how can they see your show? Give them all the information. Well, they can go to uh, BorisLHensonFoundation.org. That's our website. And if anybody is looking for a, a therapist or, or interested in yoga or any other um, sort of form of healing, we have a resource guide. Um, and if you go to our website, website you'll be able to, to click on there. And if you are out there and you're a supporter and you wanna help us continue this cause, which we think is dire, um, you can always text um, to our website, No, I'm sorry, to our No Stigma campaign. So you just text, no stigma to seven zero seven zero seven zero to support. I I, I, want, I do have one more question for all of y'all. I, I would love to know some ways, you know, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation plans to continue targeting black men. And Jay, 
What's some ways to get black men to take that step for the for the people that's like, oh, I want I want you to go to therapy, and you're like, nah, I don't need it. I'm good. What's that What's that way to get brothers to take that next step? Well, I think for one, creating visual aids for brothers to, to see. I think anytime that you see brothers kind of conversing in a space and allowing them to see that. Um, I know when I posted a picture, I had <laughs> I'm already booked up, and I had so many guys that were reaching out. You know, says man, thank you for this man, and I want to sign up. And I think it's it, it's being consistent with the push and being yeah. consistent with the message. And I think that would uh, truly help more brothers because as brothers begin to see that this is a safe space, and then also as Taraji said, it's just the love for the black man. I think it's going to encourage them to get con- continue to seek uh, 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 these outlets for healing. And Tracy and Taraji, what's some ways the foundation plans to continue to target brothers? Well, in 2021, we're going to continue to offer free therapy. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to let up on the brother. We're not going to give up on the brother. Not now, not ever. So as long as we are living and breathing and we have the capability to support, we're going to do that. Um, We also have the show, you know, that's that's coming up. So we'll be addressing these issues on the show as well so they can have more resources, more resources and and more ways to connect with each other, you know, Um, so those are some of the ways that we we plan to continue the work. Absolutely. And I'm just, can I just say I'm so proud because I think brothers felt safe. I think they felt safe with us, Tracy, because yeah. we singled them out and said, this is for you. And how often does a black man get lifted up like that by us publicly? Mm-hmm. We we opening our arms to you, black men. You know what I'm saying? Here, mm-hmm. come get nurtured. Come heal yourself. Mm-hmm. And black women are saying that. Like, mm-hmm. I think that had a lot to do with it because because we singled them out and made them feel special. And we're going to continue, continue to do that because the world treats you like crap. Yeah. And we turn our backs on you, brothers. What we got? What we right. got? Yeah. yeah. We need you. Keep healing, baby. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Taraji. Thank you, Jay. Really thank you, Tracy, Jay. Jay, thank Jay, you. Jay Burton, thank you guys. Taraji, thank you guys thank so much. You, and we should do this more often. Just have these conversations. So whenever you guys yeah. need to call in, call us in. Yes. Let's do it. All right. Yes, I love it. Okay. Thank you, Queens.